Yes. Uh, I uh, am a frequent uh, debater on internet uh, discussion groups, uh, which is sort of a new forum uh, that, that uh, and, but I, what I have learned from, from doing this is that you're a very logical person and you understand the science and, and, and can put a persuasive case out there, but that's not why people believe. They, I've, I've found that people believe for, for emotional reasons. It's emotionally satisfying. It's not rational. And, and rational arguments just bounce off. <coughs> Do you have any thoughts on, on how, to, uh, how to reach people emo on an emotional level? Because uh, you know we can only go so far we can only reach intellectually driven people as long as we're only making intellectual arguments. We do both. We, we simply do both. First of all, remember that the internet and the people who debate on the internet and who post there are not necessarily representative of society at large. Internet theological debates consist of the extremes of the rational and the extremes of the emotional. Um, there's a kind of subculture of people who debate on the internet. So for them, remember what I said, you express a sympathy for the yearning for the transcendental. You don't discount or discredit or minimize the yearning that a person has for immortality. But let's say that you had a friend and the friend's spouse was killed in a collapsed building and your friend still insists that their husband or wife is still alive, you would not ridicule their yearning that their beloved is still alive. But as the body is being brought out of the wreckage, you would say, you're my dear friend, but you have to face the reality. Look at the evidence. I know you want to emotionally cling to the idea that they're still alive, but look, there's the body. I know you want to emotionally cling to life after death, but look what happens to the brain even under anesthetic. Look what Alzheimer's can do. Look at how we don't come to consciousness unless there's a functioning human brain. Look at how evolution works. Look at natural selection. Look at all of these things. And then you also vary not your message but your approach based upon your audience. For instance, this week, August did something incredibly strategically brilliant with the Star Tribune. They interviewed him as a rep of Minnesota atheists about the soul. Well, if he knew that if he went into a scientific argument of why there is no soul, they may not publish it. What did he do? He universalized our message and said he recognizes that what many people mean about soul, including him, is the enjoyment, music, art, that that touches what you can call soul with no metaphysical implications. Well, that won brownie points for Minnesota atheists. It was in uh, the paper. And yet, it's not that he didn't want to make the more solid point-by-point -point arguments against a supernatural soul. It's in this forum to get before the entire Twin Cities area by way of major newspaper, he made a strategic decision as to how to approach this particular reporter on this particular major local newspaper. So that's not varying the message, it's just showing a different side of it. And, and that's what you can do. You're on the internet and someone says, well, I have to believe because life is horrible without God. And you'll say, yes, life can be horrible. And if there were a God, how could he allow it to be that horrible? And maybe what you see in this world that's so horrible that makes you cling to the hope of a supernatural God, maybe those tragedies are so awful that they're incompatible with the existence of a benevolent being to start with. There you've touched emotion and intellect. Remember, this will take a hundred years, but you do it person by person. You know, we, we have to be like the Allies invading the Normandy at Omaha Beach in World War II. 
they took one inch at a time, you know, under German gunfire. And we're going to have to take, you know, when the president talks about his faith-based initiative, saving America one soul at a time, we do the flip side. We have to gain, if not converts, sympathizers for reason, one person at a time. Yes. One addendum that I would have to your approach, which I agree with completely as far as it went, is that you could also say to the friend that, that the memory of your relative who has died in the building remains in your heart and mind. And so in that sense, the life continues Very good. to be there. Uh, and that, that is how people can confuse, perhaps, the superstition from the reality. Exactly. Yes. Yes. You touched on this when you mentioned agnostics. And mm. It seems on the one hand we want to swell our ranks by including other non-believers like agnostics, free thinkers, mm. secular humanists, and so forth, um, as, as non-believers. And yet, on the other side, there seems to be some antipathy between people who call themselves atheists and people who choose other names. Um, how, what do you advise uh, in that case? What I advise is allowing every individual their self-definition. We certainly cannot afford to quibble with what we call ourselves. Any, you know, uh, if someone comes into this room and says that they are not sure about God's existence, they really don't believe in God, but um, they meditate on some great life force energy that they hope is there, we don't say leave. What we do is we get them to help us on as much of our agenda as they're willing to. Now, in intellectual debate with agnostics, the thing I say is not to ridicule them for their agnostic beliefs, but what I point out, and I did this with one of the students in the cash group at the dinner after the debate on Thursday night, who told me he was an agnostic and asked me how I would tip him toward atheism, and what I said was that agnosticism itself contains the seeds of atheism and the reason is that if you use the argument from divine hiddenness a God that wants relationship with us and wants us to worship him her it such a being would be more in evidence so the fact that such a God allows reasonable non-belief so that thoughtful people could be agnostic means that this God is withholding sufficient evidence to produce belief in many thoughtful people and the very withholding of that evidence so that non-belief is so reasonable is inconsistent with a God that wants us to know him. You see now that set this student thinking and I didn't say so you must give up your agnosticism and call yourself an atheist ten minutes from now. But you see that at least was an argument that he's going to be chewing on. Yes? I'm curious to know uh, whether there are any non-atheists non here today. Okay. I am in, a, in this, if I may explain here. myself, that I'm a member of the First Unitarian Society. I am an atheist and also I believe that there is more to life than mathematics, than science, there is emotion to life, and that the way we find expression uh, for the emotional side of our life is through a recognition that there are ideas that are not just scientifically based, but that are emotionally based, and these would be uh, Unitarian Universalist humanist, humanist ideas. And this is the meeting. Humanism for me is the meeting place uh, that, that will be where you are at. Well, you see, the thing is, is that recognizing the emotional side of life does not conflict with science because you're not saying that emotion leads to a supernatural being or emotion leads to life after death. You're talking about emotion which is empirically verifiable. We know we love and we know that we recognize beauty, we know we can get happy, we know we can get sad. 
But that is not the kind of appeal to emotion which contradicts science. The kind that contradicts science is saying, well, I know in my heart I'm divinely created, so evolution cannot be true. See, so what you're saying is not a threat to the atheistic worldview. It is just actually helping us with a larger picture. But we don't have to jettison anything in atheism to get to where you are. See, that's, that's very, it's very, very important. Um, we all have to become super diplomats without compromising on the issue. And I think this is part of, of the task. Yes, anybody? Yeah. This is a little bit different question, but the, the religious organizations, the, the Catholic Church in particular, push things like the, the, they don't allow condoms for AIDS research and the stem cell stuff, both of which are reprehensible to me. I don't understand, but I don't really know how to argue against them because they will, they back into the corner and say, well, this is my religious belief that's untouchable, even though it's condemning a lot of believe and non-believers to uh, great harm. You, what kind of arguments do you come at? The argument is, then it's a separation of church and state argument. The same one that I was making in the debate Thursday night when my opponent tried to argue that government should be able to enact even people's religious views into force of law. Religion is the type of approach that can never be legislated on unwilling people. So if someone says this is untouchable, it's only untouchable in their own minds. Once they seek to defend it rationally, they have to withstand the arguments against it. But even easier for our purposes, once they attempt to impose it on society at large, we have a right to say this is not a fit basis for crippling the liberty of your neighbor. Now let's look at that. Someone says you can't use artificial birth control. Why? because my pope is infallible. Well, prove he's infallible. Well, he just is. Well, did you know that papal infallibility came about between a deal between the pope and Napoleon when Napoleon wanted more French people for future armies, so when he asked the pope to come out against abortion, and then in exchange for that, he would recognize the pope's infallibility. Did you know that in the Middle Ages, popes would choose kings and kings would choose pope? It was all political. You know, the Catholic Church has never been able to verify miracles. And by the way, even if you're uh, a Catholic, how do you respond to the Protestant claim that when Jesus said to Peter, on this rock you will build your church, he did not mean that there would be an infallible pope. And also, how do you, as a Catholic, respond to the Protestant charge that you're supposed to only go to God through Jesus? And the Bible never said that until Jesus comes back, the pope will be... God's representative on earth. You know, and then you make the rational arguments against the religious belief system and then say, but you're free personally to never use birth control, but you're not free to take your subjective religious views, commandeer the police power of the state and enforce it on me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question. I, I, I'm really enjoying everything that's going on here. When you brought up Peter being the first pope, well, Catholicism started in 381 CE, yeah. and Peter died in 65 right. CE. So, I mean, how could he be the first pope? He never went to Rome. He died in Babylon. <coughs> you, you've got to be educated mm. in what the people are believing in, and you've got to give it to them exactly You're right. you get it from exactly. the Bible. Exactly. And if you don't read the Bible and don't try to understand it, how can you explain it? We all, that you raise a very good point. Part of our task of taking atheism to the general public is to become Bible scholars as best we can. Because in all my debates, it comes up. And you have to know the Bible thoroughly in order to begin the task of unraveling it. The better you know it, the better you are capable of showing its flaws. That's what I use with a lot of people. I, I've been a, actually an atheist since 95, but I've kept it to myself. 
because I have friends that are got leukemia and they're taking chemotherapy. Mm. And when I tell them that you're dead, you're dead. I mean, mm-hmm. when I look at their face, that's cruel. Yeah. You've got to play a game with them. So you can take the Bible courses that, because I've read it more than once. I, I can't tell you how many times I've read it. And I can pick it apart. I can really okay. pick it apart. Now, v- very importantly, when I say take atheism to the general public, that does not mean that you run to your terminally ill Christian friend and say, hey, guess what, in three months you're nothing but worm meat. You know, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's not, that's not, uh, first of all, I mean, quite frankly, the terminally ill Christian's going to be gone soon anyway and won't be voting for religious right-wingers anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. It, you know, it, 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 the people, the people, the general public is really ignorant when it comes to these things. It's just like when the wagon train, mm-hmm. when the Indians attack it, they go in a circle. Yeah. Like, Which one is the lead wagon? Nobody knows. Mm-hmm. So that's what that's what happens is that people are ignorant. Like I've had people come up to me after my wife died, and they come up and says, "Oh, I'm really sorry. I know exactly how you feel." And all of a sudden they're walking out with their wife. How the hell does he know how I feel? Mm-hmm. He's walking out with his wife. You have to experience these things. Yeah. You make a game of it. That's what I do with it. And they laugh about it, and that's a seed that you said. Exactly. You can draw flies with crap, and you can draw flies with sugar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get someone who hasn't asked. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. I think you know, kind of with a lot of adults, I think a lot of adults are wrong with action. I think our folks need to be younger. I have a 14, 15, 15 year old daughter, and I'm wondering if she'd be welcome in these forms. This is my first experience with the atheist movement. Well, the question is whether uh, young teenagers would be welcome. Uh, certainly, I think free thought groups should make them welcome. I know that at the headquarters of the Center for Inquiry and Council for Secular Humanism in Amherst, New York, there are weekly programs for young people in science, in critical reasoning. Uh, but of course, you know, that's a major outpost. But certainly, I would hope that young people would be welcome and there's a special message for young people which is there are a lot of authority strictures that you have to abide by in life but the good news is that religion is not one of them you can throw off those chains it's a very important message for young people because when you see today the number of young people on college campuses who are embracing fundamentalism one of the emotional appeals is by the way all of these restrictions on your enjoyment of life that you have to endure by being part of Campus Crusade for Christ, all of these restrictions that choke off all the major pleasures of existence, particularly for young people, you can throw off those shackles by becoming a non-believer or by becoming even a more liberal religionist. You know, and that's a message that I, you know, we must make germinate with younger people. Yes. Um, just a, there's a program that uh, started up in Minnesota called Camp Quest, which is a summer camp. Oh yes. That's geared for teenagers, and uh, August might want to speak. He's on the board of Camp Quest. Um, maybe just a, a little bit about it, because these kind of meetings, there's not a lot of teenagers that want to sit through, but from time to time, folks do come up. Camp Quest is doing a uh, skit for um, um, for our free thought follies. There's three of them. And uh, in our summer picnics, we try to have different stuff available for people that are much younger. But I guess we want to just say something about camp. Yeah, for uh, young people, Camp Quest is a week-long summer camp. But we're trying to do stuff throughout the year. We're having a uh, roller skating party coming up uh, this winter. So you should get on the Camp Quest mailing list for your daughter. And there'll be activities.
have enough so that we can have more activities on a regular basis. We need them. We need yes. them. We yes. need them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you had a question? That no, you. I just wanted to make a comment. Okay. My grandson has gotten involved. About three years ago, Steve and I paid for him to go to Camp Quest. He missed the second year, but just last year, he was the first one to sign up. But he absolutely left it. And he is now going to be in college, which I think is great. So, you know, there are things great. He's, it's great. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not from the cities area. I actually drove 106 miles to be here today. Oh, you're yeah. from where? I'm from New Orleans, which is... Uh, New Orleans! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not far from New Orleans. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, a, uh, it's not an atheist town at all, and I have a rather prominent position in town, too. So my question is for those of us who want to do our bit in small towns where people know us, uh, kind of have a closet existence. I have a few stickers on my car. That's as far as I've gone. Do you have any suggestions? Yes, a lot. My kids are 13, uh, 13 and 15, and they're, they're being raised atheist. <laughs> it is your predicament that will determine whether we succeed or fail over the next 100 years. Because it's in small town America where coming out of the closet for the non believer will determine the future of whether America will reach the tolerance that we need it to reach. First of all, if you have a government position or you're employed, until Bush remakes the Supreme Court, it is not legal to fire you or to damage your job in any way because of your atheism. And if anyone does, you have a major lawsuit. Now, if it's a social position, what you do is you begin to talk to people individually. Explain your sympathy for the belief, but explain why the evidence of science logic, modern physics, and the day-to-day -day world shows you that there's no supernatural. Explain what religious dogma has done to people. You know, it's interesting, more people in history have cut each other's throats over a dispute of what happens after the throats are cut than for any other reason. And you talk about all these things, one-on-one, -on -one, larger groups, explain you are no threat to the believer, but you want government and society to be neutral. Religion is a private matter. Little by little, you know what the old saying when you boil a frog, you set the water slowly so it doesn't jump out until it's cooked, but if you throw it in hot water right away, it'll jump out. Turn the heat up slowly so the people you are talking to don't realize that their prejudices are being burnt away. And then, you know, we're all here to help you, and I'll give you my contact information if things come up. You can, whatever I can do from Los Angeles, but still I can maybe offer some advice. But what you have to navigate is at the core of our fight, and that is the otherwise prominent person in small-town America who has to hide their atheism and wants to start coming out of the closet. How do you do that? You see, if you fail, we all fail. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. No, the gentleman, I just went to ask before. Can you run for the California state legislature? Do you identify yourself as atheist or campaign letter? No, no. What I did was I didn't at all talk about it. I talked about just the issues affecting that community. But it was known because all you had to do was Google me and things came up. What happened in my race, though, is it's interesting. The winning candidate didn't hit me on atheism. What she did was, in my law practice, I represent women arrested for prostitution, and I'm an advocate of decriminalizing prostitution among consenting adults. So she had the Long Beach Police Department sign a letter to the voters saying, this guy's talking about the environment, he's talking about jobs, he's really just a hooker lawyer. If you elect him, <laughs> you're going to have hookers on every street corner but they didn't touch the atheism. Now, what happened though is, uh, what happened is that in some cases, when we first run, we might have to be stealth and that's okay, the Christians did that. So for instance, let's say that you want to run for your local school board. I'd urge everybody here to support you and I would say, don't tell them. 
you know, don't tell them right away. They don't have to know. Just like when Christians took over school boards, it's not an issue. It shouldn't be. But once you're there, you start dropping hints here and there. But we have a right to play the game to get elected. My view is that if a group of voters are still so prejudiced that they would vote against you because you're an atheist, they forfeit their right to know because it doesn't affect them. As long as you do the right thing once you're in office for the community, they have no right to have an opportunity to play on their prejudices against us. Uh, yes? Um, speaking about uh, work issues, uh, say I have a, an employer who uh, wants to start a meeting with a prayer. Uh, or start, we had a, a, a truck rodeo recently where a bunch of us were supposed to, we, we didn't, we weren't required to go there, but we went there voluntarily. And the, the president of the company started the uh, truck rodeo with a, with a prayer. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how uh, an atheist should react to something? Well, you might just, you see, there are a number of issues. I'm glad you raised this because your situation is the second leg of her situation, which is her situation is what do you do when you are prominent in small town America and you have a society-wide problem in your community and your predicament, which is ever more vexing for us, is what do you do when you're an atheist with a religious employer. Now, the employer is not government. So he can conduct or demonstrate support for religion, but he cannot discriminate against you because you're an atheist. So I think that you could ask to respectfully not participate in the prayer. I don't yet think that you can stop the prayer from occurring but you certainly have a right not to be part of it. And if you are harassed by anyone because you are an atheist, you would then have the right, I think, to sue an employment discrimination. What city are we talking about? Uh, we'll sit in St. Paul. Okay. Uh, I would contact the local ACLU and ask them uh, about this and because they would need to look at where the Minnesota courts are in employment law. Now, of course, in California, we have the situation where a, a Wiccan was able to sue their employer because people were making witch jokes about her. And that was held to be, as it is, you know, religious discrimination in the workplace. So if the employer lets you not participate in the prayer, also, if the employer presses you to participate, there's a tremendous violation of your rights. And then you would probably have to contact the ACLU or Americans United in Washington to see if there'd be enough legal talent available to help you. But I think that the way to begin is to point out that you don't want to participate. And if there's resistance, to gently remind the employer that the law backs you entirely. And you're not trying to stop him and the other employees from praying, but you as a free American cannot be coerced into prayer and then take it from there. But you see, once again, between the two of you, whether you know it or not, you are on the front lines of our major problem. The atheist at work and the atheist in small town America are the vanguard of whether this will all work or not, because it is in those situations that our enemies are at their most extreme and can do the most damage. See, another horrendous thing that we have to deal with, it's really, really difficult, but we have to discuss it is, to what extent can any of us as individuals, to what extent are we willing to be personally martyred for the cause? I mean, it's a horrible thing to have to contemplate, but Ultimately, are you willing to lose your position? Are you willing to be fired? No one can make these decisions for you. 
but it's our job as brother and sister atheists and organizations like this to support you in the decision you make. So for instance, let's say that by confronting your employer you would lose your job. I'd recommend everybody here, don't pressure him to do that. Don't say he has to take one for the team and lose his job if that's something he can't financially afford to do. Rather, his situation is delicate, support him in whatever he decides. You know, support you in whatever you decide. Because we're all going to, many of us are going to come to the point where to come out of the closet is going to cost. And only each individual can determine how high a price we're willing to pay depending on the context.